Assalamu alaikum everyone on behalf of Pakistan Alliance for Early Childhood Education. I welcome you all on our webinar on inclusive education. I believe that education system should be such that it should cater the needs of all the children, irrespective of from which background and which age group they are coming. And every child should have access to participate in the learning process. And that sets the very foundation of this narrative of inclusive education. Now what inclusive education is, how we can implement it into our own learning system, especially in Pakistan, and now after pandemic, global world is you know, working on this, that no child is left behind. And education is uh, you know, given and knowledge sharing is given and not to mention uh, to the mainstream, but to uh, differently able children as well. So, because when we are talking about inclusion, that involves all segments and all kinds of kids with all challenges there. For this topic, we have a very dynamic panel with us. I'm very thankful to all three ladies. I'm going to introduce one by one that they have taken time to join from different parts of the world to share uh, those challenges and what tremendous amount of work they have already done in Pakistan and how we can learn from them. So with much ado, I will introduce, I hope that I'm going to pronounce your name right. We have with us, Debbie Camry Roy. Mashallah, she is a PhD from Brunel. Uh, um, this is Brunel. Is it? Is it? Am I pronouncing it right? Yes. Uh, University of London. She's a lecturer in occupational therapy, director of education for European MSc in occupational therapy. She has, um, I mean, like worked uh, for nine past years in uh, Pakistan and on the projects which were related to occupational therapy and inclusive education. So uh, Debbie knows a bit of Urdu as well. <laughs> Once we are going to go to her, you will listen to a few of the, you might listen to a few of the words. So she recently uh, was part of, um, a as a principal investigator for the International Action Research uh, Project that was uh, for the development of role of occupational therapy in inclusive education in Pakistan. And uh, this was in collaboration with different organizations, which included British Council, HEC Pakistan, then the Brunel University, Dow University of Health and Science, AMI School and UCL Global Engagement UK. So I mean like, um, Debbie, what a wonderful work, mashallah, you have done. And now I move to our second, uh, speaker and uh, Madhya, I had known for like last two years when we met last time when she was here on inclusive education. And she was doing the same work, the passionate lady sharing the knowledge around. And we thought that we are going to conduct such an event where we could bring this learning to people of Pakistan, to the teachers, caregivers, nurturers. It is so important. And now today that dream is coming true after two and a half years that we are conducting this the first webinar of the series. Madhya herself is a fellow of Higher Education Academy UK and works for University College London. Uh, she's expert of educational leadership, research training programs, capacity building of doctoral students and gender um, equality initiatives. She's also chair of UCL Parents and uh, Cares Together, PACT Network. She's also won the prestigious UCL Excellence Award for, uh, you know, sharing exceptional leadership skills and supporting parents and families at UCL. We are looking forward to uh, from both the ladies that they are going to bring that knowledge to you know, our country and help us, you know, uh, elevate our parents and educate them and bring those synergies there, inshallah. She sits on several committees and working groups, 50-50 Gender Equality Committee, Springboard for Women Committee, UCL, Ethna Forum, and she also leads Ethna Swan. I would really like to talk about this initiative to you after this webinar there. And this is an initiative which is an award for advancing women in science, technology, you know, mathematics, and then medicine and so on. So I mean, like, uh, that's amazing. 
wonderful work that you are doing. Then the third speaker with us, uh, Seema, she is member of their team when they were working in Karachi. So uh, Seema Javed was part of that. Mashallah, she certified uh, um, early childhood uh, education development trainer from Aga Khan University Institute of Educational Development. And she's working as a teacher and teacher edu educator at AMI school for the last 20 years. You have given you two decades of your life to early childhood development, mashallah. And she is also a trainer and conduct workshops. So I mean like very heavily loaded ladies with a lot of you know experience. I'm not going to take much time. I would uh, directly jump to Madiha. She's going to tell you what is going to be the sequence of the webinar because it's a unique webinar in itself where they are going to give you hands-on training alongside. So it's not only talk, it's practical based. So over to you so that you can explain uh, how it's going to go. Thank you very and much. Once again, Thank you, Aroos. Thank you very much. And assalamu alaikum. Good morning. Good afternoon to all colleagues joining in on the Zoom call, on Facebook, on YouTube, wherever you are joining in from. Warm welcome to this session. My name is Madiha. And as Aroos has very kindly um, given an introduction to myself, we will talking, be talking briefly about ourselves in a minute. But before that, I wanted to say that this is in itself a massive uh, sort of collaboration across at least three different countries right now. So I'm in a different country and Debbie is in a different country. Samreen is in a different country and Aruj, of course, probably uh, in Pakistan, I think in a different city. So well done to all of the, all the people involved in getting this uh, scheduled. I think IT and Mahvish are here also. I want to say thank you to them for being here uh, on board. Uh, let's get started. So uh, developing inclusive education in Pakistan through action research. This is going to be a workshop style session about one and a half hours long. And the way we will work is that we will share some information with you about our project. We will share some key findings, some key learnings with you. And then we will ask to engage with you. We will ask you to give us your input somewhere, either through the chat windows. Later on, we will be using breakout rooms as well. Um, the, I think there will be two parts where we'll be using breakout rooms. So uh, I think without, and I, of course, at the end of the session, we will give you an opportunity to ask your questions as well. So with that out of the way, a very warm welcome from the inclusive education team. You can see on the screen, there's this picture of um, six dynamic smiling women, uh, which who have been extremely fundamental part of the, the project. Um, you can see Debbie at the very back, the, the tallest lady that Debbie will be talking about her experiences in a minute. I am there in the picture as well. The other team members are the school leads and the occupational therapy leads. And all of this will come together. All of this will make sense once we come to that part of the presentation today. We have a website, uh, www.otiepakistan.pk. OT is for occupational therapy and IE is for inclusive education. We are on Facebook, we are on Twitter, and at the bottom, you will see the email addresses for the key contacts for today's uh, session. So moving on, okay. First of all, what will, we do, what will we be doing today? First of all, we will define inclusive education. What does it mean? Then we will discuss the individual differences in learning. How is education different for every individual? Because not two people are the same. Then we will try to understand how our project, the Action Research Project, it empowers students, teachers, occupational therapists, families, the community, the, the, the bigger picture. And then we will understand some ways to prepare the class and the school for inclusive education. What are the practical ways in which we can do that? Then we'll move on to discuss strategies to learning, to enhance learning, to improve learning in the context of an inclus inclusive approach. How do we make it better for everyone, include all children in it? And then we will discuss and reflect on some video material and some case studies. We will be doing a bit of, a, of almost like a question and answer session. And finally, we will learn about some approaches that facilitate inclusion, that help inclusion. And then we'll understand what is the impact of these strategies on the learning of students? How does it help them? 
So it's, it's going to be a jam packed session, get ready. And the first thing I think it's, it's time for you to engage with us. What is the problem of exclusion? And for this, I think we will dedicate about three minutes to it. This is what we have to do. Think about a time or a situation when you were a child, when you were in your school years, when you were excluded from an activity, from a, from a maybe like in, a, in your classroom, maybe in the playground. It could be a one-off thing, it could be an ongoing thing. And then once you have thought about it, then write in the chat window, how did that make you feel? And just one word, a few words is enough. And I'll start by giving you an example. When I was in my primary school education, I was not a fast runner. I used to be picked last for all sporting activities. So I was always the person who was the extra. And I felt very excluded. And that used to make me feel less confident about myself and less confident about my abilities. So now, if you think about it, please, and then write in the chat window, anyone experienced that made you feel excluded? Yeah. Demotivated, yeah. You lose motivation when you are excluded, yeah. And when the teacher stops you from participating in certain activities like playing cricket, it's only because of your gender or because you're a girl. That is obviously, it's, it's excluding because of your biological trait, not because of something that you have done wrong. Anyone else? Yeah. If you ask too many questions, the teacher thinks, okay, this is the smart person. This is the problem creator. Put them down. Let's not ask them next time. Yeah. So I think the reason we ask you to think about how exclusion makes you feel is because if you can feel it, if you can relate to that feeling, then you can better understand that how it has impacted your careers, your educational journeys, what it means for you today. So those feelings that were probably many, many years ago, they still stay with you. Okay, so now we will move on to the next part of the session and I'll give over to Debbie. Yeah, what I will do, good morning, assalamu alaikum. Um, I, uh, I will give you a little bit of background of why we need inclusive education. So I'm going to give you some of the, you know, uh, maybe it's a bit harder to, uh, to listen to because it is uh, about rules and, and laws and things. But really listen, because uh, what it is about is about the right of all children uh, to be included in life and particularly in education. So if we start with the Convention on the Rights of the Child, I hope and I know that you all have heard of this. So this was adopted in 1989, which in a way is not that long ago. Um, a lot of the 20th century children didn't have rights. And it was universally agreed and it's non-negotiable uh, for every country in the world to make sure children achieve these rights. And it's, so it's a minimum entitlement of freedoms and it must be respected by all governments. And it was founded on the respect for the dignity and worth of each individual, regardless of race, color, gender, language, religion, opinions, origins, wealth, birth status or ability, and therefore apply to every human everywhere. So you can see it includes ability. Um, so all governments and individuals must make sure that they um, not only claim those rights for themselves, but also make sure they do, do not infringe on the rights uh, of others. There is one article of the CRC that is specific to disabled children. So this you may not have known, so that, that that's, uh, we need to know. Uh, disabled children should enjoy a full and decent life in conditions which ensure dignity, promote self-reliance and facilitate the child's active participation in the community. So they have the same right to participate as everybody else. 
but they also have the right to special care and assistance, which is needed and appropriate for that for their condition and to the circumstances of their parents and carers. And the right is actually to receive that free of charge. Now you'll see in many countries, including Pakistan, that you have to pay big money to get therapy or support in school for your children. So it's important to know that actually that does go against children's rights. It's not just Pakistan, it's most of the world. So it's not an accusation for one country. Um, so they need effective access to ordinary education, but also training, healthcare services, rehabilitation, whatever they need to get as full and um, decent a life as possible. And this also uh, must include exchange of appropriate information in the field of prevention. So making sure that there are less children born with disabilities or less circumstances that might lead to delays or, or other problems. Um, and that exchange of information should be between services, but also um, at national level and also between countries. Um, there have been other um, things that happened since, since that time. And I will just pick out the Salamanca statement, who, which says uh, basically almost the same, but a little bit more specified to education as the previous slide. But what they then say is why this is so important. Um, they um, state in this that regular schools with this inclusive orientation are the most effective means of combating discriminatory attitudes. Because if you put children in the same class, um, then it means that those children grow up together. And over the years, it will uh, reduce people's fear of uh, people who are different, because when they grow up, they will remember they study together. So that, ha that um, means uh, you create welcoming communities at the time that you are doing it, because parents will be involved, and teachers will be collaborating more, but also uh, in the future. Um, and that makes that, that society as a whole will become more inclusive, um, as well as making sure that all children are in school and therefore education for all, which of course you also know about as uh, early childhood educators, uh, will be achieved um, because quite a large percentage of children do have disabilities and learning needs. Um, the other thing, the other side of it is that if you um, um, build an inclusive approach in school, it means actually that the education for all children will improve because you have to become more aware of individual needs and not only children with disabilities or special needs have their unique strengths and needs, but actually all children do. So it, you often see that when schools start to become inclusive, that their education approaches and effectiveness really improve. Um, and also, uh, given the fact that every child should be in school, it is much um, cheaper, of course, to put them in, in the same mainstream schools rather than uh, build a, a separate special education system which is expensive um, and uh, labor intensive. So therefore, um, we believe very strongly that the inclusive education is the way forward for Pakistan. Of course, um, the, the International um, Sustainable Development Goals um, are very strongly um, also promoting that all of these goals should be worked towards in inclusive ways. Um, so, you, you know, you, that there's um, fighting poverty, fighting hunger, uh, general population health, quality of education, but within, within all of these, um, it is that uh, they have split out uh, advice and guidelines for how to do that in an inclusive way. And we'll come back to the inclusive education part a little bit later in the slides. So it's, it's not something optional to be inclusive. It is actually from the international guidelines and even national laws. Um, it is actually an, an expectation and a responsibility of all to be um, inclusive um, in education, health, society of all people, regardless of ability and regardless of all these other different um, characteristics. Then briefly about education in Pakistan, I'm sure you are aware of this, but just to put it in a context, of course, the net primary school attendance is still really low um, and it's not really improving over the last decades. So um, 
only 70% for boys and 62% for girls. And also, if you are in the poorer 20%, the poorest 20% of the population, you it's only 42%. Uh, against um, the richest 20% in Pakistan, you have a 74% chance of being enrolled in a primary school. And only overall 62% complete primary school. So that is actually very serious uh, for the whole country, for not just for children with a special needs and disability, but for all children, as you as early childhood educators well know. So 23% of uh, the population is in uh, the um, secondary school age, 10 to 19, and the gross lower secondary school enrollment is only 44%, so that's even less than primary. Um, the, the youth literacy rate is therefore only 79% for boys and 61% for girls. So there you see the gender uh, imbalance as well. Um, the adult, adult literacy, literacy rate is still only uh, 55%. These uh, were the most recent numbers we could find, so it might have slightly shifted, but I'm not optimistic that it has shifted a lot. Um, now, what happens if you do have a disability or special needs in Pakistan? Now, it's so difficult to know how many are actually in school. Um, there is not really any accurate data to be found on the numbers of children with disabilities or special needs in the first place. Um, a lot of them, particularly in rural areas or poorer neighborhoods, are hidden completely. Um, we don't know where they are and how many exactly. Um, there's also no accurate data on the number of special schools. There are uh, initiatives of private and NGO small schools in, in areas that, that are quite hidden. Of course, the government will be able to tell exactly how many special school places there are, but they are um, not sufficient for the number of uh, disabled children. It is still quite rare to see children with obvious disabilities in mainstream schools, and it's unclear how many children there are who, whose disability is not really visible. So they may have um, a dyslexia, for example, you can't see. And if your teachers have no idea about what it is, they just think, oh, why is this child not learning to read and write? And they get moved to the back seat. So that it's very difficult to to really get good data on this for Pakistan. But it is likely to be very low. And the estimate uh, by um, organizations like UNICEF and UNESCO is that of children with an obvious disability, uh, only between five and 10% children uh, are in any school at all, whether special school or mainstream. And because teacher training is still quite rare, luckily this is now improving in Pakistan with, with better um, uh, teacher education colleges now starting. Um, but because a lot of the teaching uh, population, uh, the professional group, uh, did not get full training either before they started teaching or in service, teachers are not well equipped to really support children with special needs or anybody who's different than the norm. But of course, now. Um, more and more schools are waking up to the fact that uh, inclusive education is important and that children should be included. Um, so uh, this is brilliant. The awareness is now really beginning, but how um, truly included are these children? It's very difficult to know. Um, just as I said, just a slide to, to show you um, the uh, Sustainable Development Goal number four, which is quality education for all. So they have also split that out into quality inclusive education, um, which, which means that they have targets for teacher training, that all teachers should be made aware and be given uh, basic strategies, at least in their initial training, that it's important from early childhood education, very important, where it is still easier to do and more fundamental for skill development, but also into primary and secondary education and beyond. So it also means that there should be opportunities for uh, disabled children and those with special needs to, um, uh, to have training for, uh, for work, vocational jobs. Um, so, and then for older children and adults who have not had the opportunity for, to go to school, um, 
literacy and work training for them is also important. So it's it's uh, it's very important that we know that these are these guidelines are there and we should pick them up in Pakistan to make sure that all Pakistani citizens have the opportunity to build a, a, a valued and a decent life. So we're now going to go into breakout groups uh, very briefly. Madiha will put you in the groups in a second. Um, it's just five minutes, so don't take too much time saying, hello, I'm so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so. Just uh, whoever is in your group, start talking together and um, tell each other whether your school admits children with disabilities, uh, so the more obvious disabilities, um, and then how does your school support children with difficulties in learning, behavior, or other skills? So these might be children that it wasn't clear that they were admitted at the time that they were admitted that there might be any problems, but now they're there. And what does the school do when they find out the children have some difficulties? So then as soon as the, your breakout group closes, um, write in the chat using one short sentence per question per group. So very fast, five minutes, get talking and uh, reflect on what your school is doing at the moment with and for children with special needs. Okay, so if technology works all okay, you should all be going into your breakout rooms now. Give me a minute, please. That's great. That will be interesting for all the participants to you know, interact and share. <laughs> okay, so I have to do manual assigning. Uh, whilst I do that, please continue, continue, Debbie, to maybe talk a bit more, and I'll just quickly get that sorted, yeah? Yeah. So what I'd like you uh, to think about is um, the school that you're teaching in, or maybe if you're a parent, the school that your child is in, um, why, why would they uh, not admit children with disabilities or why would they do it? And also uh, what is, um, maybe think about what does it mean for the school as a whole if there are children um, with special needs in the school? So I think now the groups are starting. I can see that I can join a group. So let's see what happens if I join. So is anyone in the main room? I think there are some people here.
Sadia Aisha. Are you here with us? Are we in the large group or uh, we are in the breakdown groups? Yeah, we are now okay. in the big group again. Okay, big group. Okay. Yeah. So Welcome. I'm not sure if you can still see this, my screen share now. Uh, no, Debbie, we cannot. So I think you need oh, to share again. Oh, okay, I'll have to share the screen again. That's fine. Uh, may, I, may I tell you something about... The Very disability? briefly, you can, yes. Yeah. Uh, we are also, our organization is also working on disabled. Uh, there is a primary, primary school for disabled in our Tessil, and we are regularly working on that uh, kids, especially through uh, Sun CSA member. We are working on their nutrition as well. And okay. uh, we, we, are, we will met with their parents. They, with the teachers 
and we have trained them to check their lunch box especially and breakfast to the parents that their their nutrition is very mm. essential for Excellent. their mm. health mm. so we are the member of nutrition international as well and the sun cs scaling up nutrition pakistan and we are working with the dis- district uh, government as well so Excellent. yeah yeah i just sab inshallah in the end we'll have question answer sessions yeah. and Thank it is you. so great that all the organizations are joining hand which are very relevant over to you debbie Yeah, thank you. thank you. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. It's very good to see also collaboration between special schools or or centers and mainstream schools. That's very good. Did anybody write in the chat what you discussed? I think uh, not everybody was teaching in the groups that I uh, joined. Um but um and it was a bit mixed. So some schools uh, do um uh, admit children with disabilities. clear disabilities and some don't um and where it happens um the attitudes then tend to change for the better so that once people f- lose their anxiety and fear about what to do with those children actually it tends to improve but on the other hand of course a lot of schools are not uh, not equipped and the teachers aren't trained we talked about that as well and this is a real issue and that is also one of the reasons why we did this project that we'll talk about in a minute so that we then could also develop materials and now we're starting to find uh, bigger platforms where we can share that so um uh, we're very aware of the fact that there's a lack of training yes very much so um right so we'll go on now to uh, have some more theory let me see if i can get the slides to go forward yes So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about occupational therapy very briefly because what we did is we realized that for teachers uh, even anywhere in the world it's not easy to do it on your own and occupational therapists have very good skills that uh, that could help in an educational setting. Come on slides go forward for me. Yeah. So basically what occupational therapy aims to do is to enable people to participate in in everything all activities of life. um so participation is always the the core then uh how do we do that we work always collaboratively with people no, never uh well sometimes you do it one to one of course as a, a therapist treating uh, one patient but actually there's always the family there's always uh, the teachers at school or the boss at work whoever we're working with we work uh, around that individual with people but also we work in groups or in communities um so uh, we don't only work with people who are um either sick or disabled or uh, in, ill in any way but also with people who are excluded for other reasons and that is more and more in recent years so uh, sometimes people are restricted in participation because they are socially excluded and it could be because they are disabled but it could also be because maybe they're homeless or maybe they are from the wrong ethnic uh, group in that uh, local setting um or they're in prison for example there's all sorts of groups of people we work with who are not necessarily um uh excluded because of um disability but other reasons um this is also how we're now starting to work much more at school level so um the world federation of occupational therapy has come out with a position statement of why uh, occupational therapists should be included uh, uh, involved in school work and uh, so the world federation supports the international policies on inclusive education which i briefly introduced you to before um, it emphasizes the responsibility and skills of ot's to support it and then it's uh, very importantly the way occupational therapists have started developing this role has been at uh, three different levels so um if you look at these three levels that are written on the screen now what we used to do only for a long time is that individual treatment of individual children but actually what we are now starting to do is uh to work at at uh, the primary level which is universal design for learning that includes everything from making sure the school environment is accessible physically uh, in terms of layout in terms of how visually impaired children might be able to cope uh, so so the basic environment is accessible 
um, and the attitude is uh, of, of all involved is, is uh, welcoming and inclusive. Then there is a secondary level where uh, children's um, uh, needs will be recognized and there might be uh, some changes in the curriculum and teaching ac uh, activities that um, are for, for certain children. So for example, uh, simpler text or um, uh, different visual um, uh, handouts or um, uh, activities that are extra in order to help some children to, uh, to be able to, uh, to follow what's happening in class. And then, of course, we also look at that individual child. Um, sometimes there will be individual treatment, but usually in schools, it is more about making sure that the teacher knows how to um, to adapt what she's doing for that individual child in the teaching activities. And again, in this position statement, that collaborative support um, is uh, is emphasized. We will always work with the child, with the teacher, with the parent, with the other children in the school in order to make um, it possible for them to not only participate at the social level, but also to achieve their learning potential in the school. So just a picture for you to uh, to have an idea. So if you, if you look at that universe that the, on the left, it's at universal design for learning at the bottom. Um, it's a pyramid. So most of our work and the largest number of children involved is at that is at that level, that a universal design for learning, the primary level. What does it mean in the other blue triangle you can see? It means that all the typical classroom instruction, the core curriculum, we will look at that together, teaching staff, occupational therapists, school management, to make sure that that curriculum and those materials are accessible as widely as possible for the children. And then differentiation is for smaller groups who get some extra support. Um, so it's group supplemented instruction. So you might pull them together in smaller groups. And then accommodation at the third level is for a very small number of children. Uh, and that is intensive one-on-one -on -one intervention by an occupational therapist, uh, by a teaching assistant, um, sometimes by uh, intensive work with parents, how to support them in their homework, etc. So I hope that is um, clear for you um, how that idea works. And that is got, it's kind of an international ap approach now. And uh, Mediha will now take over and talk a bit more about uh, what we did. Thank you. So uh, everyone, I think by now you have had sort of uh, the background for what is actually inclusive education. We have spoken to you about what it feels like to be excluded and also what impact it has on your own learning, your own educational journey. We have also spoken to you about the role of occupational therapy. Debbie has spoken about the, the research side of things. Let's talk a bit about now the practical side of things. What did that mean for us? I'm going to contextualize it for you so that you can understand it better. Basically, whatever Debbie has spoken till now, it formed the fundamentals of our project, which is developing the role of occupational therapy in inclusive education in Pakistan. It was a collaborative project, action research, I'll talk about in a minute, between occupational therapy departments of Brunel University London, the Dow University of Health Sciences and the AMI School in Karachi. So basically it is an interdisciplinary approach between different occupations and it brings together professionals and experts from a variety of uh, professions to benefit the inclusion of education in school settings. The project was funded by British Council and the Higher Education Commission of Pakistan. And like uh, colleagues are saying in the chat window that to even begin with, there was no bare minimum training that was available or to begin with, the teacher had no idea how to make their classrooms inclusive despite wanting their best to. And this is where the role of collaboration comes in. Next slide, please, Debbie. So what we did was basically action in research what happens in action research is that the first phase is you sit down you look at the issues so you look at the problems you do almost what is a situational analysis you analyze the problem what are the barriers school may kaha kaha pe gaps hain. somebody said teacher training somebody was saying if parents accept karte that their children have special needs 
once you identify those gaps, then you start to plan in, an, in a cycle, okay, what am I going to do about it? You start planning how to address those gaps. When you have done the planning, then you act upon those plans. You act upon those interventions. After that, you observe action what has been the impact of that action. Was it good? Was it bad? What were the learnings? What went well? What did not go well? And then once you have made observations, then you sit down and then you reflect on that. Okay, this was okay. This can be done in a better way. Okay, this needs to be changed. And then it continues to go round and round in a spiral. By spiral, I mean a cycle. You plan, you act, you observe, and then you reflect. And it is a dynamic process which goes on throughout the, the research, throughout the process. So next slide, please, Debbie. So what happened in this project actually was that a team of occupational therapists and a team of teachers, they came together to, to work as one big team as researchers for the betterment of the child, essentially. The child was at the center of everything that we planned. So what you can see on the slide is client-centered practice. The client here is the child, the family, the, 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 the child himself. What we did, I think we, 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 came, we worked together. We had gained a lot of sort of skills along the way. There was a lot of respect for the people's skills and insights. So the teachers realized that the occupational therapists have a very important role to play in order to make everyday life easy for children. And at the same time, the occupational therapists realized that the teachers are doing a really, really almost challenging, difficult job in order to give education to a child who has got special needs then we were taking responsibility for our own choices we were enabling participation from all the team members there was a lot of flexibility there was a lot of uh, room for negotiation room for different ideas room to respect other people's opinions and all of these are actually keeping in view the links between the person the environment and the occupation the, the triangle which debbie referred to previously as well so these are the principles of interprofessional collaboration it is not as simple as okay a teacher will come in and they will just deliver the lesson and they will go away it is about how that lesson can be made more inclusive for all children Okay, so now you know a bit about what we did. This is my favorite slide, and um, I will invite you to think about it a little bit. Jo pehla aap circle dekh rahe hain on the very left hand side, the exclusion circle. Uh, sometimes uh, I use an example, maybe it is relatable to you. Jab chote behen bhai hote hain, when you have younger siblings in the family, they are not included in the decision making process ghar mein jo faisle kiye jate hain jo important decisions hote hain ye jo colored circles hain the blue circle the red circle the yellow circle outside of the big circle they are all younger siblings unko ghar ke faislon se dur dur rakha jata hai bahar rakha jata hai they are excluded okay take one step more maybe if you know you talk to your parents and you say okay you know bachcho ko bhi faisla mein include karna chahiye they will say okay come in the room sit down in the corner maybe you know just just go don't don't interfere that is segregation they are in a separate group they are not in the big group they are in a separate group and they have really no connection between the two circles then if you, you know if you beg your parents a lot you know no we, we want to be part of the decision making too let's say humne holidays pe kaha jana, we want to be part of the decision they say okay come in the room sit down but don't interfere just sit in the room and you know that's it really that is integration that's when you let them in without facilitating much of their engagement and at the top you will see the inclusion circle which means that when you finally your parents are willing to listen to you they are willing to um, consider your opinions they're willing to understand what you're saying and they can facilitate that that is called inclusion very quickly i want to apply the same rule to inclusive education think about the first circle the exclusion circle normally the situation is kejo ki special needs and the ones who have additional needs they are excluded from mainstream schools the the big circle the green circle is the mainstream school and the dots outside that are the children with special needs they are excluded they are not included in the mainstream schooling 
okay, one step forward, maybe the government has special needs schools in some cities, maybe big cities. And that is a one step towards inclusion, nothing wrong with that. Maybe some needs are so specific that they're, they're only catered for in a special needs school. That means segregation. There are two separate, separately segregated entities. One step further, integration. That means that we are bringing in the children who have special needs into the mainstream school. But what we are doing really is maybe um, give them a, a teaching assistant in the classroom, give them a desk and a chair in the classroom. Maybe sometimes they face towards the wall. There is not really a lot of um, engagement and a lot of um, a lot of uh, working together in the mainstream. That is called integration. And that is usually the case in majority of the schools in Pakistan. Going forward, pushing that forward, the final step is inclusion. True inclusion means that you have to your educational lessons, your teaching style, your school ke setup ko essay design designed that it promotes inclusion of mainstream children who have no needs and of the children who have special needs. So this means that all the children, they live in the big same circle and all of them are actually benefiting from the teaching and interventions. So I hope this picture, this graphic gives you an idea of where we want to be, exclusion versus inclusion. So let's talk very quickly, how did we apply this action research approach in our project? What did we do? First of all, next click Debbie, please. Uh, our overall aim, basically, we had to define what we wanted to do, and our overall aim was to develop the role of occupational therapy in inclusive education in Pakistan, which means that how can occupational therapy help to make education more inclusive? How can the two professions work together? How did we do it? What, did, what was our method? to systematically work together to develop teaching, remedial materials, lesson plans, and strategies to optimize the inclusion of all children in the school using an action research process, plan, act, observe, reflect. How did we apply this? How we worked? First of all, like I was saying previously, we sat down, we did a situational analysis of the school as a whole, that what are the factors that are good factors that are actually helping the school become inclusive? What are the barriers? What things are not working properly? Then we also look very carefully at the physical environment of the classroom. What is the access like? Stairs uh, ke jana hai ya nahi? Kis class mein kitna room hai? Lights kahan lagi hui hai? What are the walls like? We looked at the social environment in the classroom. Who, who is the most popular child in the class? Who is the quietest person in the class, etc. We looked at the school playground, this way, that's where the most social interactions take place. So in a whole, we did a whole situational analysis of the school. And then after that, we did classroom observations as well. And in the classroom observations, they may or may not focus on an individual child with special needs. Uh, it could be a person with special needs. It could be a person as a mainstream who was also part of this, the, the same classroom. And we use the person environment occupational model to reflect on what helps or hinders the child to participate in the class. And remember, we are not talking only about children with special needs. We are talking about the classroom as a whole, because inclusive education means everyone should benefit. Everyone should be included, not only children with special needs. And then uh, we did some resource development. So we sat down, we looked at the teaching materials, we looked at the teaching strategies, we came up with some inclusive lesson plans which benefited all children. For example, somebody who, had, um, who was a slow learner, who had problem with handwriting, what could we do to help that child? And this is where the next part of our um, workshop today comes in. We will be going into detail with one of our team members from the Karachi team. Samreen Javed is here with us today. Um, we also, of course, on I think on this slide, I want to say that in our quest to make inclusive education a reality, we had to work with parents as well. There were parents involved, there were other professionals involved, for example, people who are at policy level who are making decisions about inclusive education. But my part was most probably, I think uh, one of my highlights was working with parents, working with families to make them understand that this is the, the, the support that your child needs. We cannot do it. We need your input. We need your engagement. You see, it's very easy for, um, for, 
families and for parents to send their children to school and say, okay, that's it. I'm my responsibility finished. Now it's the school's responsibility. I'm a mother. I have a daughter. She is 16 years old, but and she's a grown child. But I have a responsibility with her. I cannot, I cannot deny that that's it. She's gone to school. That's where my role ends. So it was really important for us to work with the bigger picture, to work with parents and families as well. And we did a lot of engagement, a lot of consultation with them. And one of the good things that came out was that when we inform parents, when we tell them what inclusive education is, they are very willing to come work with us. They are very willing to support their child's education at home as well. And I think I remember one workshop where we were talking about addressing bullying. We were talking about addressing inappropriate behaviors. We were talking about the engagement from, from both mothers and fathers. And I heard a lot of mothers say that, can you please do something about father's involvement as well? So it, it, it began to emerge that not only parents had needs, but also they wanted us to do more, more engagement with them. So the approach was benefiting actually parents, families, children, teachers, and occupational therapists. It was a collaborative approach. Okay. So I think this is the bit where I would like to introduce our wonderful team member from Karachi, uh, Samreen Javed. She is the academic coordinator at the AMI school. And actually, I just realized that there was a slide at the very beginning about introductions, which I probably skipped over. So my apologies for that. But anyway, here we are. Uh, Samreen, are you online with us? Yes, sir. Wonderful. So Samreen, uh, the, the reason we want to do a question and answer today is that it becomes clear to you what it meant in reality, what was the project like in, in, in sort of in a nutshell. So Samreen, my first question to you is what was your role in the project and how did you work in collaboration with the occupational therapists? I don't know, we can't see Samreen's picture. My camera is, is, is destroyed. Yeah, there we go. I can see you now. Go on, Samreen. What was your role in the project part A? And part B is how did you work in collaboration with occupational therapists? Okay. Uh, as I've been al already I've been introduced, my name is Samreen Javed, and I'm an academic coordinator at the AMI school. And I've been working there since last 20 years. Our school is, a, uh, as you can see in the slide, is a very dynamic institution. And... Uh, since 20 years, I've been seeing that we have been working for this cause of inclusion. A school that is, a, is an inclusive school, we have been using a lot of inclusive strategies. And uh, this, uh, then a, a school became a part of this action research uh, project. And so I had an opportunity to work with a occupational uh, therapist of Dow University and with Debbie. And uh, we have been working with Debbie, Lee, uh, Debbie before also. But uh, during this uh, action research project, uh, my role was of uh, uh, a researcher, it was a, of a, a role of a research, um, uh, facilitator, a teacher, because I was uh, working along with, collaboratively with the occupational therapist. So I was uh, like a moderator between the teachers, last teachers and the OTs because we were uh, making, like we were deciding uh, and uh, thinking of new strategies. And then we, I was uh, supposed to you know, talk to and give this message to the teachers. And then researcher, we used to uh, observe and plan strategies and then uh, write resource logs to note down and report all of the work that has been done. And the way we worked was that uh, the, the OTs visited us and then initially we shared the difficulties and issues we had in our classrooms. And then we observed uh, the classroom along with the occupational therapists. And the OTs observed them to a different angle that we learned uh, gradually that they you know, not only observed the difficulty that the child had, but the issues in the environment, as, that, as well as the tasks that had been given to them, the ac activities. So uh, then we critically analyzed that, and uh, then we uh, you know, worked out strategies that had to be used uh, to uh, improve or to make change uh, in that, uh, to, uh, uh, to work on that issue or the, the solution for the, the issue. So. Uh, uh, that actually takes me to my next question, which is actually, can you give me some examples of the techniques and the methods that you used in your classrooms after having spoken to OTs? And Samin, would you mind uh, bringing your mic closer to your mouth, please? Yes. So the question is, can you give us some examples of the techniques and the methods that you came up with after collaborating with the occupational therapists? All right. So, uh, yes, the strategies were very, uh, 
a lot of. So I'm sorry, your sound is quite low. So okay, can you hear me now? That that's better. Yeah, thank okay. you. All right. So uh, there were lots of effective strategies that we learned and uh, uh, that we worked on during this action research project. And one of them was some of them I'm going to share with you. Uh, one of them was multi sensory approach, and uh, it was uh, uh, like uh, involving and engaging multiple. Uh, senses and uh, multiple uh, modalities in into learning and teaching, uh, including sense of sight, hearing, touch, and movement. So uh, we noticed that not only the children who are having difficulties in uh, recognition of letters, numbers, words, and concepts, and understanding of concepts, not only they learned but also all the children benefited from that. So, uh, um, uh, we, for example, one of the uh, this was uh, one of the activities. Some of the activities were writing on sand trays and sand, writing on different textures. So, which gave the children a tactile, uh, which improved the tactile memory, and they were able to recognize and learn better. We also made the children uh, move on letters and numbers or words, which helped them memorize them very easily. Also, some uh, movement break was one of another uh, approach or strategy which was which worked very well, which have we have been using, which we shared with other schools as well. So, uh, in which we we gave frequent movement breaks in the classroom in the in the school uh, in our classes. So the children were more focused and engaged, and it not only worked for those children who had issues in uh, sitting tolerance, who couldn't wait and couldn't sit for a longer period of time, but it helped in generally. And uh, the children were more focused and they were more. Active well, as well as uh, as as well as focused after that, and they uh, the teaching became more interactive and uh, in, uh, and uh, the children were more engaged and fun filled. Thank you. That's very helpful. So, Samreen, I'm interested to know that in in the recent um, situation in the wake of the global pandemic of COVID-19, surely it has been the hardest job for teachers to stay engaged with students to give them lessons online to to make the lessons meaningful and this is why i mean normal teaching has become so difficult i cannot even begin to imagine what inclusive education would look like in a covid 19 context so maybe can you tell us a bit about how you adapted what you learned in the project how did you adapt it to meet the requirements of the inclusive education during the global pandemic of covid 19 okay so, um, as I've been sharing with you, like the skills we learned. Close, closer the to your mouth, please. The okay. mouth, please. Yeah, better. Okay, fine. Okay, so uh, the, the the skills and the ideas that we learn and the strategies that we learn also work during this COVID nineteen project. That those things that we learned during the action research project, and also then uh, we uh, also uh, like uh, uh, researched more, and then we were able to find out a lot of uh, strategies uh, to adapt to the situation of uh, COVID nineteen. All right. So uh, some of them was using uh, like planning, uh, changing, pla making changes, uh, uh, making changes in uh, uh, plans, lesson plans, and adapting it and modifying it according to the change the need of the COVID nineteen. Like the classes were going on online, and so we what we did was that we made uh, uh, our lesson plans like we broke broke them down in slots and we made them uh, uh, like uh, passive and active we gave passive and active slots in them. So the children were more engaged in them also, and we were able to teach them also. Another thing that we did was that, we, which we also did in the action research, was that we used resources in hand, the resources with the material that was with us at home and the, the material that was with the children. They, they had those things at home. So we made use of those, those materials. And then we asked them to, uh, like in the, in the plans that we used to send, we asked them to use that material. We also, uh, uh, made the parents work out and develop material. We also taught them how to make, like, for example, Play-Doh, use uh, things that are, easy, are easily available at home. For example, the caps, the right letters on caps, use them as manipulatives. So things like that, like, like that also we used uh, to improve our teaching and learning process. Then we also used a lot of movement breaks because they were at, the children were at home and they wanted to be more engaged and uh, they were not that active as they were at school. So we use a lot of movement breaks. So we included that strategy as well. Then you, the school has also started a YouTube channel. So yeah. we have been uh, sharing what we did, the, all the good stuff that we did, uh, the inclusive strategies that we have been using. So we are a uh, school spread, plat a YouTube platform. We have been sharing this with everyone that could you know, uh, engage and that could take those uh, as uh, like, to use in their schools. So that is another initiative. 
so we have been doing this all of this thank you that's very helpful and i think um you mentioned about uh, in movement breaks, for example, you mentioned about YouTube channels, you mentioned about talking to parents as well. That's really helpful for us to know because what the project looks like in reality, that's the, that's the thing that brings it to life. So, uh, Samin, I'm interested to know you worked on the project for three years. Well, you're still working on it, really. I think uh, you have been a wonderful part of the team. We have all worked together. What have been your key highlights? How did the research benefit you as an individual? Okay, as an individual, like uh, myself and all the other teachers that were engaged, we all uh, grew professionally, we all learned a lot. We learned uh, through this interprofessional collaboration, we learned a lot from the occupational therapists. Like uh, some of us didn't even know who the occupational therapists were before that, and some of us knew, but we did not know the, their actual work. How do yeah. they work and what were their strengths? And then we were able to share our challenges, and that, may, that was good. Uh, like it is also good for the occupational therapist as well. So uh, we grew professionally, we learned a lot, we learned very good skills like decision making, problem solving skills, those skills improve. And uh, now we do not we do not look for experts to solve our issues. We have started looking like solving our issues ourselves. This gives That's this, excellent. That has given us this trend. So you are an expert yourself, actually, in inclusive education. And what do you think, how has the school benefited, you know, in terms of uh, uh, incorporating inclusive education as a strategy? How has the school benefited? As I already shared that uh, school is an inclusive school, but, but it, uh, and it's always looking like a school is always, it's, it welcomes everyone who can share more uh, innovative strategies, new strategies for uh, inclusion. We always work towards it because uh, it, the, including uh, like new strategies that we learned from the occupational therapists, including them in our school, made our school more better, we can say, and then it worked. we worked towards school improvement. We were able to share those strategies with all the, the all the teachers. Now, everyone knows about all those inclusive strategies. We were able to share this with the, with the parents. So it uh, took our school to, towards improvement. And then now you can see that we are sharing it with other schools, we are sharing it uh, on through the platform of YouTube. And exactly. uh, so it, the, our school improved and all the children benefited from that exactly. as inclusion is uh, benefiting everyone. Everyone, so absolutely. The strategies You're we are right. using are better for everyone. Everyone, exactly. And I think this is the, the, the beauty of inclusive education that it benefits everyone. And uh, I have one last question, Samreen, and I know that there are teachers and educators on the call today, and there are some questions in the chat window as well. We will come to those questions in a minute. We are kind of almost um, towards the end of the session now. My last question, Samreen, is that for all the teachers, all the educators on the call today, what are your um, top top three suggestions, what can they do to make their classroom settings more inclusive? Okay, first of all is that like, uh, this is a, usually what we do is that when we, uh, we have an issue with a child. So first thing, this is uh, what we have been doing that we always think that the, that the issue is with a child. So now, the, now you have learned that we have to consider the per person, environment and, and task, okay, to find out where, where the issue is. Secondly, yeah. now we have to, as you, this was an introductory session, I would request you to learn more about inclusion and you will find out that it, it is not only good for the child you are, the, or specific children, but it, is, it will be good for your school. If you will add inclusive strategies, if you include them in your, in your school or in your curriculum, if you make your school uh, curriculum more inclusive or start, you will include an inclusive strategy in your school. And thirdly is that some of there, there are some very effective strategies like that I've shared with you. If you go through a resource guide, then it will guide you. You'll find out all that we have done. You will be able to use those things and please, please do use those uh, strategies and you'll find that uh, they are really workable and, as we have used them and you'll, find, you'll benefit from those things. Perfect, thank you very much. Just to, just to recap, I think if in case your voice was cut off, I think the first thing you said is that uh, remember to understand where the problem is or where the challenge is. It is not the child who is the challenge or who is the problem. It could be the, the, the environment. It could be a number of factors. So I think the, the first step is that try to understand the challenge. The second one you have mentioned is to learn more about inclusive education because it is good for the entire school. It is good for the entire classroom, not only for the child. And the third thing is that you have said that 
go to the resource guide that we have. And I think Debbie will talk about that in a minute uh, to find out more. And I think I want to add to that, that all the people on the call today, you will understand that it is not at all difficult to incorporate inclusive education in your everyday teaching. It is a bit of smart working within the same resources. Yes. So thank you so much, Samreen. Uh, I will hand over to Debbie now. Is that Debbie next? Yep. Yeah, over to you, Debbie. Yes, thank you so much, Samreen. That really brings to life uh, what we did and how uh, the uh, project has affected the AMI school and the other schools we worked with. And uh, I was so pleased when we talked recently about the, uh, the pandemic, how uh, clearly you were saying that uh, um, having done this project helped you to adjust to that huge challenge as well. So um, yeah, so it's, it's really fantastic to have that. Thank you, Samreen. Um, one of the things we've been saying a few times is that we produced a resource guide. And if you go to our website and uh, download a resource guide, it is full of all sorts of information about different types of special needs that children may have, about um, uh, how, uh, how we worked uh, towards solutions and some of examples of those solutions as well, and lots of uh, links also to resources um, online that you can use in addition, not in addition to the resource guide. So um, this is the front uh, cover of our uh, resource guide. Um, it's divided into background and introduction, so you'll learn the key concepts, what is inclusive education, what is action research, what is OT. Um, then there's this practical strategies for inclusion at a school and classroom level, uh, but also responding to specific challenges. So there's examples of, of very common uh, special needs in children and how that, um, that challenge along with the environment and the occupation, that's the activities taking place in school, uh, were um, uh, difficult and, and then resolved through this process. We also talk about how you could collaborate with others and, and promote inclusion with, with uh, people outside and then those links and resources. It is uh, available in English. We, we are hoping to still get the Urdu version out, but uh, that might take some time. Um, but you can uh, download it for free. Um, okay, I'm not sure if I'm going to manage this now, and we are running out of time. But basically, what we were, uh, what I would like you to do is all go and download it after the session, and then at the end, look at the formats which you can help in your own classroom, which is questions for situational analysis. So, what do I need to know about my school before we can start? working towards becoming more inclusive. And then uh, also uh, you will see, and it's explained earlier in the guide, but you will see how we used forms uh, for classroom observation. Um, so uh, when you sit in the class, what do you do? What do you look at? Uh, do you pick out individual children? Sometimes you can do that. Or sometimes there might be an issue that's at classroom level, like uh, one of the classes, for example, in KG2 was very, difficult to manage as a class. So then we observed and we took the problem at class level. And there we, uh, we uh, use uh, that uh, PEO uh, approach, which is the person, the environment, and the occupation, as we said before. So the child with their strengths and their needs, their special needs as well. Then you have uh, the environment, what is happening in the classroom, is that classroom enabling that child to learn or distracting or just hindering that child to learn, and the activities that are taking place, the social activities, the teaching activities, including the materials um, that are used, um, how are they making the problem worse or better, and what could we do, and often what we do is about the environment and occupation, to then enable that child to, uh, to learn uh, together with their peers um, as, as well as they can to their fullest potential. So you're going to have one more short break, breakout group and you really need to start thinking now. So I've, um, uh, I want you to just one person who has an example that comes to mind from the classroom. Um, uh, so a, a child probably or, or a, or a whole class uh, where you face a challenge in teaching due to special needs or behavior. And then you use that idea of where is the problem? Is that problem just the child's problem 
or are there problems in the environment and in the way we offer these activities that make that problem worse? So discuss these three aspects and then think of just one thing that you might do to change in the environment or the, the teaching activity or the social activity that could then help that child to be included better. So you can think again, I've put that triangle there again, you can think at that universal level, am I going to do something that is for the whole class um, or does this need to be done in a smaller group or which I don't really want you to talk about is how can I fix that child's special need because you're not going to be able to do that very easily and very quickly. So I'd like you to think at those uh, two uh, bigger levels of universal design and differentiation. So, uh, Madiha, are you going yeah. to I'm going start to open putting the... now? Yeah, and I think you've got, shall we say 10 minutes, Debbie? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, there we go. You've all been invited to join the breakout rooms, so please say yes to these.
we're just finishing, I think, in 20 seconds now. Okay, welcome back everyone. I hope that worked out. I know I had to move some people around because there were not many people in one group. So please forgive me for the interruption. I had to move people around in order to make sure everyone benefited. Inclusive approach. Debbie, you might yeah, be on yes. the oh, Yeah, yeah, just... Uh... <laughs> My screen was playing up there, sorry. Thank you so much. I, I heard a very good example uh, in, uh, in the room where I was, and I hope that you found this really helpful to um, get away from only describing what the problem of the child is, that person, uh, but then to, to start looking at, okay, given that we have this child, what is now happening in that environment, the social environment, the acceptance, uh, the friendships, uh, and then the, the educational environment, um, uh, the physical environment, etc., and then what the child is expected to do, those, those occupations, that is activities, school activities, that might actually make the problem worse. And then from there, start thinking about, so what can we do, particularly about that environment and the, and the uh, activities that uh, will help this child to reach their potential. And once we start to do that, we often see that the child uh, one feels accepted, that emotional acceptance, and then also discovers that when they're allowed to be who they are in that school environment, they start to enjoy, uh, gain confidence, and therefore then the, the activities that you are now designing in a more inclusive way, they can do it, and then they build up their skills very quickly and become part of that social context that is their class, but also where the class benefits from those much more creative and fun and multi-sensory activities that are now taking place. So all children actually learn better as well. So I hope that came out in all groups, uh, but it was fantastic to, uh, to hear you talk. So let's see if the slide will move on for me now. Um, somebody, I think you were going to finish us off. Are you still okay. there? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we had a nice session. So now based on today's webinar, what will you do? Now you have learned like uh, some of the, like what PEO is, what are some of the inclusive strategies, we shared some of the inclusive strategies uh, with you. And then you found out that what is the situation, current situation of inclusion and special needs uh, in Pakistan, special needs in Pakistan, the children of special needs in Pakistan. So these are the points that how will you make your school and community more inclusive? We have to make our community and school more inclusive. So what are we going to do and in, for admitting more children with special needs? For inclusive, admitting more children with special needs, supporting all children in your class to participate in and learn, working together with therapists and parents, lobbying your school management and local government, or for, the, for, for that one child that kept coming to your mind when you listened today. So you have to discuss and then you have to write uh, one short, I think we don't have to discuss, just write one short sentence in the chat box. Okay, so whatever you have learned from today's webinar, you just write it down, okay? That one child that, kept, uh, that comes into your mind or whatever you know now uh, based on your knowledge that you have learned today, please write in the chat box one sentence, a short sentence, that what, how are you going to make your school and community more inclusive? आप अपने स्कूल में कम्युनिटी में को किस तरह से और इंक्लूसिव बनाएंगे किस तरह स्पेशल नीड बच्चों को इंक्लूड करेंगे और अब आप अपने स्कूल में अब आज के वेबिनार के बाद जो इंफॉर्मेशन आपको मिली है आप किस तरह से थेरेपिस्ट से मिलेंगे या स्कूल मैनेजमेंट से बात करेंगे कि ऐसे बच्चों को जो स्पेशल नीड वाले बच्चे हैं उनको आप अपने स्कूल में एडमिशन दें और अब अब आप क्या किस किस्म की स्ट्रेटजीज अब यूज कर सकते हैं जो नॉलेज आपको इस वेबिनार में मिली उसके बाद So please write uh, one thing in the chat that you can do, you as a person can do in the next few weeks. 
somebody likes the action plan, the action research. I think the plan, act, observe, reflect. Very good. Use that cycle in everything you do at school, but especially if you're working with challenges in inclusion. Shall we move on? Of course, um, everybody's plan should be to download the resource guide and have a really good look through that because it will really give you lots of ideas and it will, uh, the, the way we have written it is we want to encourage every reader, whether you're a teacher or a parent or an, a professional, uh, like a, a therapist or a psychologist, whatever, you can include children. The way we've written it is very hands-on, very much giving examples of how we did it. Uh, there's no expensive or complicated materials that you need. You can do something to start uh, being more inclusive as a school and to have that inclusive attitude as a person. So somebody wrote... Uh, what we'll do something. is that we'll upload uh, that guide on our website as well. So there are a lot of people and organizations, they'll benefit from it, inshallah. And all those I, I think put the uh, put the link to yeah I think maybe yes, put the put link, the link. To, to our website yeah that would be great yeah uh, Nazish uh, you've uh, written something and acceptance and soft admission policies yeah empathy awareness regarding different able children also like PEO the idea of uh, analyzing what's going on and it reminded me of my students having a struggle based journey yeah. So um, I think one thing is also think of any children that have struggled. Also, if it's, um, it's not like a, a disability, it could be uh, through a social uh, issue or, or sometimes gender or whatever. Uh, that attitude is really important to be inclusive to all. Absolutely. I'm very trying very hard to copy paste the link to the, uh, the resource guide. But so it's don't worry, we will, we will put the link on our Facebook, uh, uh, Facebook as well in Perfect. the message box. Perfect. Thank you. And so, then the presentation will be uploaded on the website as well. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, thank you. So any <laughs> any final questions, any final words from anybody who would like to? Gabby and Madia and uh, Samreen for the wonderful session that you have explained so many things. I just love uh, what uh, Debbie was explaining and enthusiastically when they started off and so many organizations collaborated with them. And then especially the person, environment and occupational therapist that PEO concept that you, you were talking about, then planning and observation and analysis and then acting on it. It is very important. And then Madhya said that it's smart teacher working. So we, we had a question while you were going through. Somebody asked, I think, uh, that how many students were uh, in the class and like uh, there was there only one teacher? Let me go back to the question. One of the participants, they asked about it. Samreen, would you like to answer that? Yes. Um, how many teachers do you have in a class and how do you go about uh, taking challenged children along with other children? So they, she, she, she wants to know that you have mainstream students and along with that you have challenging students. How, how do you manage? This question was by Rosmina Akhtar. Okay. Debbie, would you like me to answer? Yes, please. All three of you can one by one. Okay. Right. Start from you, Samuel. Yeah. Well, uh, in like in uh, early years uh, in kindergarten, even till grade two, especially in early years, we have uh, in uh, in nursery in kindergarten we have two teachers per uh, you know fifteen children, or seventeen or even if uh, twenty, and um, we have we always we, we include a lot of, all the children with special needs, but we you know maintain a ratio. We do not have uh, very challenging needs in in a, in in one classroom. Where the teacher would not be able to then she would not be able to handle it, even if it is assistant assistance uh, she has got assistance and assistant teacher is there but this has to be kept in mind so there are there are uh, like children with specialty need in the classroom but they are not uh, of uh, very uh, like their uh, challenge is not that much they are not very the, the those special needs are not very challenging so we always keep in mind that there is that we have to maintain a good ratio 
and uh, also as i told you that we have for 16 to 17 even for 20 children we have two teachers in in our in our class in one class uh, till you know uh, you can we this keeps on going till uh, kindergarten kg2 and in grade 1 and 2 we have teachers that you know help those teachers but they uh, the teacher only teaches and uh, when even if if required then there is resource teacher also uh, for for helping those teacher uh, for those helping those children but mostly the teacher is planning for those children and she is there to you know uh, be with them and she she plans she makes inclusive plans and then she teaches is a relevant question on facebook so actually um, very quickly sorry yes. the question is about sorry. how about if the proportion of special needs increases to 50% in the classroom would that still be inclusive so the question is on so, facebook so, is, shall i answer this yeah, so on, i um the ami school has uh, has um taken a very wise decision that the and the percentage of children with significant special needs so so more severe special needs um cannot be uh, the majority of the class because then it it it's almost becomes like a special school if you think about it if the 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 need for all schools to become inclusive is paramount because if all schools include children with special needs then it won't be oh ami school includes children with special needs let's send all the children there then it's not a mainstream school anymore yes. then it's not an inclusive school then it becomes more like a special school that doesn't work so 10 15% is the uh, is a, a percentage that you can manage and then of course the because the teachers then also need to have that training in how do you make an inclusive lesson plan which means that from from the bottom up from the start that you you uh, make your lessons you ensure that that is done in an inclusive way um it will work if uh, all the children were now piled into one school then it is not inclusive anymore and then you would need uh, lots of additional teaching staff it is a problem of course in pakistan in in poorer schools particularly that you have huge numbers of children in the class sometimes up to 50 80 children that makes it a lot harder um it doesn't make it impossible but it makes it a lot harder and this this cannot always be resolved at class at school level schools also need uh, a significant funding from the yeah. from the government the government is not actually resourcing education at all i mean it's only like 2 3% of the whole budget whereas in in countries where education is prioritized it will be 10% or like that is the basis of 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 your population um uh, being educated being therefore being able to do jobs that will uh, contribute to your economy so you cannot resolve everything within a, a small school context it is important if you want to prioritize on where to spend your money is more uh, two people in a class so a teacher who takes the responsibility for all the planning and the overall class management plus an assistant a teacher who can uh, then um sm- uh, for example work with small groups at one time or with an individual child at another time help organize activities uh, that that is a real priority uh, for using your money not materials you don't need the materials you need teachers that are well trained and extra staff this is something That's that is absolutely lovely. beautiful because uh, during your presentation you mentioned that you guided uh, samreen that how they are going to use that material especially in pandemic which is available at home so yep. most of the teachers they feel that they require expensive material and then they are going to execute another fact is that they need to keep this in mind that they are talking about minor disabilities the major disabilities they cannot handle unfortunately people uh, people they don't have those skills and their teachers are not equipped that becomes more challenging uh, i have a question debbie when you were like working with the uh, inclusive education in pakistan what was the challenge that you saw most uh, when you were bringing this narrative to pakistan what was the most challenging thing was it the mindset of the teachers was it the you know, that there were not f- no facilities available or there was a rigid attitude what was the main thing that was like uh, you had to really fight i that there's lots of challenges and um, one is that once a, a school a school system or a school um has a, a curriculum and a approach to teaching um they will not easily um 
move away from that. So especially if you are in a government school, for example, you, you know, you have your, your uh, syllabus, you have your school books, and uh, you have very few, very few materials in your class. Um, it's very difficult for individual um, school teachers and, uh, the, and their, their head teachers to make those changes. So, but it does happen. We, we unfortunately, we didn't find a government school to include in the project actively that we tried, but that <laughs> didn't work out. But it is possible. There are uh, government schools that are definitely uh, changing the way they then use, okay, the syllabus they have, but then the way they train their teachers in uh, lesson planning, for example, in managing the classroom socially and uh, ensuring that all children collaborate together and work together and they can include more. So it is uh, the, the systems, the, the infrastructure is, is a real problem. Then of course, there is the lack of training and, and there, uh, there is now better um, teacher education starting in, in the, from the government sector. Luckily, that is starting to come up. But um, a lot of our uh, teacher um, uh, um, population has no uh, pre-teaching qualification. Um, and that is not their fault. It's just not there. So this is a real problem. So a lot of in-service uh, training and education is really important. This is why we find these um, uh, webinars and, and sessions so important that people first become aware and then start to say, well, where can I get trained? And, and that is the next step. Um, attitudes are more often actually from parents than from teachers, that the parents of children uh, without special needs, so who think that children are all hunky-dory, they do not really uh, want disabled children in the class because they say it's contagious or, uh, you know, um, it will distract from what my child is learning. And the, so the attitudes in the parents and community are often harder to break than the teachers because teachers often have a will to make every child in the class succeed. And uh, even if they initially say, oh, I can't do it, when you actually engage uh, with teachers, they will often be willing, um, as long as the school then also supports them to do so. So it is a whole range of uh, problems. And, and on that of point, Debbie, very quickly, there was a comment on Facebook as well. I'm monitoring the questions on Facebook. Somebody asked about the attitude of parents who have children with special needs. They do not Absolutely. always accept it, which is the first stage. Really. Yeah. And I think we, we had that problem a lot. And um, the, the way we, we could not, of course, remediate it 100%, but what we discovered through our project was that the more you educate parents, the more they are willing to come and listen. Because to begin with, they had no idea. Um, they, they don't accept our children's no problem. You have made the air, and this and that. We get a lot of that. Uh, social pressure, what will they say? Your problem. own child is suffering because of that attitude, exactly. unfortunately. So mm -hmm. once you start to engage with parents, sit them down, explain to them properly, this is not the end of the world, they do come, uh, they do come forward. Anyway, I'm mindful of the time. There are a few more questions. Over to you then, Ayush. Yeah. Let, let's see that. In, Gigi, so Sabrina, if you want to add something. Nadesh was asking what kind of special need, uh, like the special need children that are in our schools, what kind of special needs do they have? She wrote. So uh, she said, she just asked. So we have children with uh, Down syndrome. There are children who have uh, learning difficulties. Also uh, children with autism and with some physical difficulties also as well, like uh, learning uh, de developmental delays children who are having uh, difficulty in walking or other physical issues. So we do have all of these children. And I think uh, you are right that Debbie is right and all of you are right that attitude matters. It is that the research was very successful in uh, our school especially. And we also saw in some other schools uh, because of their attitude. They were very willing to accept that. They, like, uh, as I told you, our school has always been inclusive. So the attitude was there, so the acceptance was there, and that's why everything worked, worked well. And we also saw it some, in some other schools that it even worked, even though the, the schools were in a, in situation in, a, in localities which were not, you know, there were poor people living over there. The socioeconomic level was not that high, so but the attitude uh, was welcoming. They tried and they, you know, improved after that when they applied all those strategies. So that matters a lot. That's great. There is another question. How do you plan activities? So I'll take it considered as the last question. So all three of you can one by one answer that 
usually the teachers they find it very challenging that they have to cover the syllabi and then they alongside they have to prepare different activities and when we talk about that diff children are different and they're keeping in mind their requirements you need to come up with you know different sort of activities and then you have to make it uh, economically viable as well so how do you plan inclusive activities for children i think the most important uh, aspect here is and samreen can give some example maybe in a minute but um that the emphasis is on inclusive lesson planning so you're not planning in principle you're not planning separate activities for a child sometimes you do so for some children like if they have quite a, a learning delay you might have to make a simplified version of an activity sometimes but the I, the principle is that you don't do that the principle is that you make an inclusive lesson plan so for example you um there was a picture earlier on uh from there, there was a couple of children in a class 5 geography a class where um there was this one child who could not remember all those difficult specific names for landforms you know you have a plain and mountains and uh whatever and um so what the the teacher then did in inclusive uh, lesson planning is the same content the same chapter of the book but she made um uh, uh cards which were laminated which had the name of the landform and the pictures and then she made a background and then children in turn uh were uh, allowed to come up and, and match one of the names with the landforms so the, the the children there were two children who had great difficulty with this before they were they were actively engaged they were able to walk up to the, the front of the class they were able to look at it they were able to put it up and they were able to then achieve that learning goal at the same time all the other children were saying oh miss this is so good now i can remember it so easily so the when you do it well that time that you spend in uh, in uh, making that activity is not just for that special person that little child it is actually for the whole class your teaching overall will become more sound it's activity based learning it is it is multi sensory learning so samreen would you like to add something to that yes uh, deb you're right uh, we have been like using inclusive strategies it's a part of a, like we plan lessons uh, uh, inclusive lessons where we uh, consider like basic uh, basically we considered multi multiple multi sensory approach as a main uh, uh, project as as a main aim actually because you all learn in different ways and if we are using all those different ways to teach so everyone will learn so it uh, we will not specifically one of one child but we are working we are planning in a in a smart way as matia shared and everybody is learning through it so like uh, in one of the examples that i shared that a child who ha was having difficulty in uh, writing letters and remembering them because in in easy classroom you know they mainly they have to uh, learn to write, read and write words uh, letters and then words so we use we have started using now multi sensory approach the children now all of all the children write on sand trays and uh, salt trays which are you know easily this is not an expensive material so children all of them they write uh, they look at the letter then they write they form it on that tray saying its formation and saying that letter so uh, uh, the sense sense of touch sight hearing everything is involved so we have found out that everybody is learning even the children children who are having uh, who were having difficulty earlier they were also learning but everybody was learning the recognition of those letters and numbers is better and uh, every uh, like they are if they are they are able to re retain it also so the children who have been who were previously having difficulty in retaining them remembering them they, this this issue, issue has been solved and there are many more other you know very effective strategies that you can find in the resource guide and they will be very helpful so all those inclusive strategies if you are going to use it in your classrooms less material uh, less effort and teacher is also very happy the classroom is very fun filled and engaged interactive everybody is involved and once uh, the teacher gets used to of this inclusive planning then it is also not an issue she started thinking this way so she started thinking inclusively so then it doesn't matter at all uh, it you know uh, it becomes easy planning planning becomes easy learning becomes effective so this is one of the uh, examples that i've shown thank you so much thank you so much anything you want to add madhya ha I just want to add that this MacBook is not inclusive at all. It's not trying to let me copy paste the link of the resource guide. So I want to say thank you to Aruj. I want to say thank you to the people who are here. 
I want to say that inclusive education is new concept, but it is not a difficult concept. It is about okay. understanding and it is about adapting the same situation to benefit everyone. So think about it carefully, look at the resource guide and we are on Facebook, we are on Twitter, we have shared our emails, we are very happy to come to you, we are very happy to talk to you more about inclusive education because it will benefit everyone in educational settings. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Daibi, Madiha, Samreen, you people have uh, you know done a remarkable job. Not only that you have explained the concept, then you have done uh, you know, number of interactive activities with the you know, people so that they get to know how it's done. And I, I believe if you're a teacher and you're passionate about it, so every child becomes your responsibility. It's just about taking that small step, a, a, a little mile more that you need to do. And when you're talking about inclusion, inclusion is a simple concept that you don't want any child in your class to be left behind. You don't want your child to feel insecure. You don't want your child to be neglected. You want each one of your students to be loved and cherished and cared in a way they want to. If a child is kinesthetic, you need to teach him in a play way method. You can't make him sit all the day. If the child is tactile and you are keeping things away from him, that child will make you devastated. When we say that you need to observe and learn, I had an experience that the child was tactile and he used to dump and you know touch my shirt, touch my finger. And I used to say, hey, what's happening? And my coordinator said to me, he's a tactile child and he's going to learn that way. So I mean, like as teachers, Observation is the key. We are not going to understand what playground is given to us, those uh, future seeds that we have to sow. We need to invest in them. We need to observe whatever strategies we are applying. We need to revisit them, whether they are effective or not, because children are not like a tree that you can't move them. You keep experimenting and you realize whether this thing is working on this child or not. It is a tedious task because you are nation building. You're doing the nation building. You're working with life. So that requires that amount of sensitivity and learning. I believe that inclusion is very easy. If you just that get, you absorb that notion that being teacher, in, uh, inclusion is an integral part of whatever you are going to do. And I'm very thankful to all three dynamic ladies who have explained it beautifully. Someone wrote in the comments that uh, uh, when are we going to have a workshop on how to develop inclusive curriculum? So this was just a flavor that we wanted to give you, inshallah, in future. Yeah, I have requested Madia and Debbie and uh, their entire team, Samreen, that they could plan some workshop, which is a bit extensive one. We have just touched base. But, you know, whenever learning is taking place, there is a lot more that is not visible. Like you're saying how to devise the curriculum, how to devise a lesson plan, then how to go into the nitty gritty of it. Inshallah, we'll be conducting more webinars or down the line, I would request them to think about a certificate course that, that can be only on inclusion and, you know, in detail. And till that time, the beautiful book they, they, they have developed, we are going to share the link, download it, go through it. There is a lot of material available on the internet and get equipped. And uh, we are here. The one of the purpose is to bring awareness. That's why we are conducting this webinar series so that everybody gets educated. And I'm very happy that you know, one gentleman already said that he's uh, working with the challenge students. And that's how, you know, organizations, they combine and synergize and create more impact. I'm very thankful to all the participants, all the people who are watching us and listening to us on Facebook. Share this video. Inshallah, we'll share the link on our website. Also, go there, uh, revisit this one. We'll upload the presentation that these ladies have prepared so that you can benefit from it. And once again, I'm very thankful to all three of you for, you know, giving your time and preparing such a wonderful uh, webinar come workshop for our, you know, participants. And this is where we clap. So there we go for everybody who was here. Well done. Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, yeah, do share the, the link so that more people can also watch it uh, online in your network. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you for facilitating, Aruj. Thank you, Aruj. Pleasure. Thank you, my P. Thank you, my wish. Thank you, everybody. Take care then. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.